Um, hi everyone, thanks for coming along this evening. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about this evening is something that's being introduced in Go 111. I'll try and stand still, sorry I forgot about that. Um, and that's a feature called Go Modules. And what we're going to talk about this evening is what Go Modules are and how do you use them. And in fact, why would you use them as well. Um, so this is pretty much what we're going to cover today. Why do we need package management in Go? Um, we're going to introduce Go modules as effectively an answer to that question and a number of other problems that are presented by there not being any package management in Go. Work through a couple of examples and then see how you can get started using modules and contribute back to the Go project in the process. Because And thanks again to Daniel and everybody who helped out with the contributor workshop. Uh, the one at GoForCon UK and the one back in June, huge success. I think in total there were about 130 odd people who went through that contributor workshop and that's working out how you can contribute back to the Go project. I'd strongly encourage anybody who's interested to just sort of put up their hand and ask and we might even just run that session again because it's a really worthwhile thing. Um, it just sort of gets you into contributing back to something that, let's face it, we all benefit from in here. Okay, so let's kick off. Uh, why do we need package management in Go? Um, I suspect you all have something of your own answer to this question, um, but I'm just going to present it with a super simple example here. And a lot of the content in this slide um, is actually with credit to Russ Cox, who's presented extensively on this already. So thanks to him, uh, including for this example as well. So T here, T0, represents a, a starting point in, 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 our, um, in this example. And this is when we're going to start writing our program P. So nothing special here. This is just going to be a main package. Okay? Um, as we're writing uh, P, we think to ourselves, oh, goodness, what I'd really like to use is um, a, a package that has some sort of feature. Okay? So that package is D. And so what we do is we go get D. And D at the time, is, uh, at the time of our go get is at version 1.0. Go get works by getting the latest version by default. And so we get version 1.0. I'm sort of somewhat talking abstractly here in terms of versions, but it might actually translate to versions, actual versions in something like GitHub, for example. So just, just go with the flow for now. That's time T1. So then a bit more time elapses, and we find ourselves at time T2, when we want to actually add a dependency on package C as well. So we go get C. And as you can see here, somewhat hard to represent but C has a dependency on D. Um, and as you can see, at the time we go get C, it's at version 1.8. Um, but actually, C depends on D at version 1.4. Um, but go get can see we've already got D because we got it at time T1, if you remember. And so it doesn't bother going to get D. Um, but now C is broken because it sort of depends on maybe a feature or a bug fix that's in D1.4. We only have D1.0, um, D and so we're faced with something of a problem here. So C is broken, and you could just sort of say by implication then, our program P is broken as well, highlighted here in red, and perhaps C should also be in red here as well. So in this situation, D is too old, i.e. the package version, in quotes, that we have of D is too old is 1.0, and we need 1.4. So we think to ourselves, well, there's, how can we fix this? Well, we can use go get again, but with minus u. Okay then. Um, so we go get minus u, c, because that's going to um, give us a later version of c and its dependencies. Okay, but unfortunately, about an hour ago, the author of d just released version 1.6. And guess what? c 1.8 doesn't work with d 1.6. So now we're in a situation where d is actually too new and C is broken, and by implication, P is also broken as well. So this is a bit of a tricky situation, right, uh, that we find ourselves in, and I've just lost the mouse, one second. Um, because in some situations here, go get is leaving us with a dependency that's too old, and in some situations, leaving us with one that's too new. Now this is a very simple um, demonstration here, and there are numerous other significantly more complex permutations of dependency management problems here. But the fundamental issue here is that go get just is not aware of package, package versions in any way, shape, or form. And that's probably pretty obvious to anybody who's used go get. OK, so then let's just do a very brief history run then on how the go tool itself and various third-party programs 
tools, etc., have tried to solve this problem. That is, of specifying version requirements or dependency requirements. Um, you'll see some of the names listed here that you may have used yourself, be familiar with. The one that hopefully everybody is familiar with is GoPath. Uh, it's the original way of essentially having and specifying which, quotes, version of a package should be used. It's whatever code is, on, is within your, the directory structure of your Go path at that point in time. And clearly that's up to you to manage what version, in quotes, is on your disk at the time. And you can see others there. Um, Go Depths, Go Dep, GB, Go Vendor, and Dep. The last one that, how many people are familiar with DEP? How, keep your hands up, how many people use DEP? S let's say that's around 75%, so that's a good number. And DEP was the official experiment um, into sort of package management versioning um, that was announced as an experiment to work out, okay, how should we actually tackle um, dependency and version management in Go? Um, earlier on this year, there was a proposal by Russ Cox called Vigo. How many people have heard of Vigo as well? Probably a slightly larger number, potentially. Um, in any case, the, the whole point is that all of, these all of these approaches here vary somewhat. And that's not actually a particularly satisfying situation because you can't build on top of a patchwork of solutions like that. You can't genuinely say that I'm now going to build a version-aware tool because guess what, you probably have to cater for go path, dep, and it starts to get a bit boring if you're having to deal with that sort of moving version landscape underneath you. So this was one of the main goals of actually, quote, solving the version independency management problem in Go. So this is where Vigo, as was introduced at the beginning of the year, has now morphed into something called Go modules, which will be available in 1.11. As I say here, this is just a few sort of boring, dry definitions, if you like, about what Go11 introduces in the form of Go modules. And so, but these are absolutely key. So a module is a collection of related Go packages. So it's not just one package, it's a collection of packages. So by definition, that is a directory structure of packages. It could just be one package, but it needn't be. Modules are the unit of source code interchange and versioning. Now in the past, it, you would sort of classically have had a a group of packages potentially in a repository on GitHub. And that repository has been in your um, unit of interchange and versioning. That's no longer a restriction, okay? The actual module itself is. And if you have a module that's hosted within a repository on say GitHub, that's a happy coincidence where you have the module path actually being the GitHub repository path itself. But as we'll find later on, that's not a, that's not a constraint either, okay? So the module itself is the unit of source code interchange and versioning. And that's just something we'll keep coming back to. And the idea is that as well that modules will replace this concept of GoPath with time um, into specifying what version of um, source file should be used uh, for in any given build. So underlying all of this are actually sort of three key principles to versioning in Go. Uh, that of com compatibility, repeatability, and cooperation. And again, I'm shamelessly stealing from Russ's um, uh, talk in Singapore here back in, I think, May. So if you've seen Russ's presentation, apologies, some of this will look like, it'll look very familiar. Um, but if you haven't, definitely go and watch it after it because it, it goes into quite a bit more detail on some of those slightly more complex situations of um, conflicts and version nightmares that we can get into. So just going through these briefly, the, the principles of versioning here. Firstly, com compatibility is the in import compatibility import compatibility rule. And I'm just going to read it out, and then we just talk through it a bit. If an old package and a new package have the same import path, literally the same import path, the new package must be backwards compatible with the old package. That is to say, compatible in terms of behavior, um, interfaces, you, you could literally substitute one for the other. I'll say that literally, um, we'll caveat that slightly later on, and you sh your code should behave the same. Let me sort of put it like that. Um, repeatability, the re result of a given version, the build, excuse me, of a given version of a package should not change over time. Now that feels like just intuitively a very desirable property. Hopefully everybody in here would agree. You don't want just sort of some sort of passage of time to pass, repeat a build and just sort of then get something different, and who knows what that something different is. The third, really, this is, is a point that's key here, um, and that is that we all, we all need to work together on this sort of compatibility um, 
problem here and managing the Go package ecosystem. And that's part of the, the idea behind modules as well, is to actually make that easier in some way. So let's briefly talk about versioning and just in a bit more detail here. Again, slide shamelessly copied from Russ's um, original Vigo work here, actually. But it covers it very well. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with Semver or semantic versioning, um, I've just included the link at the bottom of this slide here. Um, but it's, it's broken into a number of different parts. We're only looking at three of them here, the major, minor, and patch versions. Now, the major, mi major version is used you increment the major version, excuse me, when you're going to make a backwards incompatible change. That could be any sort of thing like a name change in a method or a function if you so wanted to do so. The minor version, new feature that you're adding, for example, but by definition, if you're only incrementing the minor version, it is the, the change itself is backwards compatible. So being an additive change, for example, would be an example there. And a patch version classically used for bug fixes, for example. There are other parts to Semver. I'm just going to skip them for now. So the key point here is this concept of semantic import versioning. So just going back one slide, one second, this import compatibility rule. If an old package and a new package have the same import path, the new package must be backwards compatible with the old package. Now, what if I've made a, a, a breaking change in my, in my package or my project, for example? What do I actually do? Well, Semver tells us that we therefore need to bump the major version, and that's exactly what we do. And so in order to actually retain and maintain this sort of rule of compatibility, the import compatibility rule here, guess what? It won't surprise you to see the major version number here in the import path, okay? And so this is something you're going to see with... Um, with Go modules and for modules that you depend on where their version number is two or greater. Okay, then we can go into some of the details of why you don't see it for one and zero um, later on. But this then allows you to effectively maintain that import compatibility rule. Okay, so that's kind of some of the dry ideas hopefully out of the way. We can come back to them with anybody who's got any questions at the end. Let's get on to a worked example right now because this is the sort of more exciting bit. I'm not as brave as Johan, so I've d done a blue Peter here, and all of these slides um, are, well, they were actually code generated, but at the same time, they are pre prepared. So I'm sorry about that. But we'll just walk through them here. So the key thing here with Go 111 is that if you actually want to try out uh, Go modules, the simplest way to do this is to actually work outside of your Go path. Don't ask me why, just do it and it will, it, you can just start using modules straight off the bat without having to try it. Hence why I'm working in the temp directory here. I'm just creating myself a hello, hello directory, change into it, and this is where you can see how modules are baked firmly into the Go tool itself. Now, they are actually sort of part of a subcommand here, or a number of bits of Go modules hang off this mod subcommand here. So Go mod in it, in this situation, is just saying, okay, we want to create, uh, create ourselves a new module here. And much like everything else, we, um, like packages themselves, the, the name of the package, i.e. the import path, is just fully qualified. It's sort of unambiguous. We're using a URL as our, as our means of doing that. So here we go. We've created ourselves a, uh, a module. Um, and as you can see, we're then just going to just ls. We can see what's in that directory, just a go.mod file. And the go.mod file is essentially the definition of our module. But it also is going to define for us what requirements we have in terms of dependencies as well. And if we just do a cat on that go.mod go file, it's very simple. You can see the actual just declaration of the module itself. OK, nice and simple. So now let's add a dependency. OK, so now I've just created myself a hello.go file. And I've imported um, Russ's quote package, which I think is, sort of has some pithy sayings and things. If, if you, you can actually go onto go.doc and see, see the actual package documentation itself. So very, very boringly, we're just going to print out a single um, a hello quote. Okay? So now I've just created that file, and the first thing I'm going to do is go build. Now, this is sort of perhaps a bit a, a surprise if you've not used modules before or seen Vigo. What it's actually doing is going out to the internet here to actually try and resolve that import that we have there. Because the Go module system doesn't actually, it doesn't have a cache of that locally, so it's trying to resolve it. So you can see it's going out there. It's trying to find the package and then downloading it. And what it's also doing is downloading that uh, module's dependencies as well. Um, and in this situation, you can see we've got a sampler package there, and we've got um, X text as well. OK, fantastic. And then we run our program at the end there that says, hello world. OK, great. So let's now see what's happened in our go.mod file. Um, 
Now, sort of slightly surprising here, perhaps, because you saw on the previous slide a number of different modules effectively being referenced here. Um, we only imported one package here, which is the quote package. Um, but you can see it actually also downloading a number of other modules here. So what's going on here? We've catted go.mod, which is, as I told you, it's the definition of our module and the specification, essentially, of the dependencies that it has. And you can see it's only requiring one, which is the, the quote package, I uh, quote module. That's where, in this situation, the package that we've imported in the module are one and the same import path at version 1.5.2. Okay. But then if we do a go list, which, how many people use go list regularly? A very small number. I'd strongly encourage people to just look at Go List because it's extremely powerful for describing the source code that you're using. And in module world, it's an incredibly powerful tool because it starts to tell you quite a bit about your dependencies. So here, that's what the list minus M is actually doing. It's sort of putting us into a module mode for list here. And all is just a special definition for all modules, including the current module and transitive dependencies. So this is actually slightly more useful, right? Because it's showing us those packages that were also, excuse me, modules that were resolved as part of that go build step on the previous slide. And you can see um, a quote there at 1.5.2, but also other dependencies as well. So the, the, as I said, the, the, um, the go.mod file is just that minimal representation of the dependency specification that we have here, i.e. We, we depend on quote here at 1.5.2. That module itself also has dependencies, but it has a go.mod file itself that describes those. And the key thing is that now that we have version 1.5.2 for that repeatability point that we had from earlier on, even if version 1.5.3 or version 1.6.0 is released, of quote, sometime tomorrow, builds in this directory will just continue to use 1.5.2 and by definition, the dependencies of quote at 1.5.2 as well. And this, I won't go into the detail of that today, um, and I'd strongly encourage you to look at Ross's presentations, etc., to, to look at something called minimal version selection and what that actually means and how it brings about this concept of repeatability as well. So let's just move on, um, and we're just going to run go build again. Um, but guess what? We don't actually have to go and fetch anything more now. Um, we know that we, we've already cached, essentially, the modules that we, the module that we depend on and its dependencies as well. So there's actually nothing else to do. So go build by definition now gives us a totally repeatable build, exactly the same output that we had before. And six months down the line, you could do exactly the same and get exactly the same output. So that's the repeatability point coming in there. So we just rerun hello again to just confirm that it's still behaving in the same way, as strong a test as that is. And then we switch into French and also do a quick test as well there. Bonjour. And this sort of explains why we're using X text as well. Um, as we saw, quote also depends on a package and module called Sampler. And Sampler uses X text for language matching. OK. So now let's look at upgrading modules. OK, so what we're going to do in this situation, first of all, is, and again, this is where you can see us using go list again. And why that's powerful, we're going to list in module mode all available upgrades for all the modules that we're using. So hence, it's totally unsurprising um, what modules you see lift, listed here after the, the sort of the, the Go finding um, the, um, output there at the top. It basically lists all the modules that we transitively reference and what versions are available for them in terms of upgrades. That's the minus U flag. So what we're going to do in this situation, the next step there, go get minus U X text is actually upgrade one specific module in this situation. And then what we're going to do is we're going to just check what's in our go.mod file. Remember, go.mod is specify our module specification and its dependencies. Now, though, we've actually specified, if you like, an, a, an increased version number dependency on the xText package that is not specified in the original quote 1.5.2. Hence why this now appears, albeit as an indirect dependency here, because it's indirect via the quote module in our go.mod file. And you can see it's exactly the version 0.3.0 uh, module that we have upgraded to. So now we just do again, the go list minus m all just confirms essentially what version number um, we are at for each of the modules. OK, fantastic. So this, is, uh, this concept of modules is just prevalent throughout the go, to go tool, including things like go test, except go generate, etc., etc. So now let's just do a quick test of all our code to make sure that everything's working after we've upgraded the text package here. Um, and I'm just going to use short test as well, so minus short. 
So it all again has special meaning, and in, as I said before, it means current module plus all its transitive dependencies, and that also includes standard library packages as well. So you can see actually this ends up testing quite a bit, but why would you not do that? If you're going to release this code to production, why would you not want to make sure that this combination of dependencies that you've had actually works together? Someone's gone to the trouble of writing some tests in the first place, I'm going to actually run them. <coughs> Fantastic. So now we kind of also can just say, well, let's run some tests on packages within the quote module itself. And the interesting thing here is all of these tests actually passed. You can trust me, they did. Um, but here I'm actually specifying a slightly different set of packages to test. And this comes back to one of the earlier points that I made that a module is a collection of related packages. But you don't have to depend on all the packages in a module. And in this situation, we clearly don't with the code that we've written. Because I'm now running the test on some other, all the packages in the quote module here, and one of them is failing, whereas this set of tests did not fail. So you don't have to depend on all packages in a module, and whatever packages you do depend on actually form part of your transitive dependency set, and that would be covered by go test all here. So, okay, it looks like there's some sort of problem there um, with, our, with the quote package, and that there's a sort of a, a, a broken package within it. Okay, let's sort of ignore that for now. Um, let's just move on to looking at upgrading all modules, because that's something you might want to do at any point in time. Go get minus u. Might not be a sensible thing to do, given that all, all the other points we made earlier on. But anyway, let's just do it in any case. And then now let's just check what our go.mod looks like, and we've actually upgraded the sampler to be um, 1.99.99. So now let's just do another quick retest here. Now we've got a bit of a problem, because you can see actually that a lot of the tests, in specifically the standard library tests, are totally cached, because guess what? The, the code that represents the standard library packages that we depend on hasn't changed at all, so no need to rerun the tests. So this, this will actually retest extremely quickly and only do effect, effectively a differential test. Um, but you can see the sum test that's failing there. I just sort of, I don't know what that test actually does, but it involves some bottles of beer on a wall. Um, so let's just go build uh, our program again and run hello. And yeah, sure enough, this kind of looks a bit weird because that wasn't really what I was expecting. Um, so let's downgrade. Um, what was just upgraded. And it was sampler, if you remember, that was upgraded to 1.99.99. And so now I'm going to do go list again, go list in module, um, module mode, just listing the versions of a given module. And you can specify any number of modules that you want there. Um, and so what we're going to do in this situation, we're actually going to actively choose to downgrade to 1.3.1. There you go, go get again, and with the special at specifier of the version we want to downgrade to. And now we can then just do a quick check again, go list minus m all, and you can see that we have actually downgraded sampler in this situation. Now, if any other packages, dependencies of sampler, also needed to be downgraded in that process, this would also happen in this situation, but it doesn't in this case. So if we can't go mod, again, we can see that we have actually downgraded the sampler to 1.3.1. And so now let's just do a retest again. You can see a whole load of cache tests. This, this, all this... Um, build and test caching came in at 1.10. Massively take advantage of it as you can and use this all specifier. Okay, fantastic. So now let's just imagine if we actually want to fork the quote package. We are actually sort of want to extend it in some way, shape, or form, or just uh, fix a bug that's in there. So what I'm just going to do is I'm going to clone um, the GitHub repo where Russ has this code, and we're just going to put it into slash temp quote. And we're going to go in there, and we're just going to get hold of the version of quote that we're currently depending on, which we can quickly check back here, which is 1.5.2, and just store that in a, in a bash shell variable for now. Um, then you can see that we get that by the echo there, and then we're going to get, just check ourselves out a branch here, and branch from the version 1.5.2 that we're, we're currently using, because that's sort of the sensible thing to do. So that's all that's going on here. There's no... There's nothing magical going on. I'm just literally branching from the point of code that we're currently using. Okay, so now we're going to edit quote.go and make some changes to it. I'm going to wave my hands at this point to say I, I've done that. Um, now we're going to go back into our module, the hello module that we find, And we're going to say that instead of using uh, the quote package from the internet, uh, we actually want to use the, a local directory. And in this situation, as you saw, because it's in slash temp quote, I'm just going to use a relative path specification here. So then we do a go list minus m all again. This is getting a bit boring, me using that command. But you can see here that quote is actually being pulled from the local directory, um, relative 
up one in the quote directory. Go build, run hello, and you can see now this is the change that I made. I don't actually know where this, what this is a reference to. Um, apparently it has some significance, I don't know. Um, so now, okay, I've made the changes in my local fork here. What I want to do is actually add them to a Git repo. So I've created a Git repo for this evening. All this code is pushed up incidentally, so you can go and check it out. Um, all I'm doing is adding the remote here, creating a commit, pushing it up. And then at the bottom there, I'm tagging it with a, my own version because it's in my own fork as well. And I have pushed the tag as well. So that tag is available on GitHub. You know, obviously, you can have more control of that process if you like of tagging, etc., and releasing. But this is what I'm doing for now. So now, actually, let's just go and use that remote version instead of using the local directory. Because, of course, if I published it, then surely other people will want to use it as well. And in this situation, all I'm going to do is say, go mod edit and then replace our use of quote to then use my fork, which is, guess what, it's that fully specified URL, the full URL um, to the Git repo, to the GitHub repo, excuse me. And I've specified the specific version that I want to use, and that's the tag that I pushed. Go list minus all again, just confirms that we're, that we're using the, mod, the quote module at that version, and that's where it's pulling it from, i.e. that replaced version that is my fork. Go build, and now, because we don't have that remote version in our cache, it's going to pull it, pull it down. Pull it down once only, and guess what? We'll do. Let's just run it in French now. Um, and if someone can translate that for us. No. I can eat glass, it doesn't hurt. Great. <laughs> Thankfully, it's the French version of what we had on the previous slide. Thank you very much. Um, so there we go. That's a, that, is, that covers quite a large part of modules there, and what well, is a very simple example. Okay? So now let's move on to a second worked example, and this might be something that people in the room are looking to do themselves, and that is convert an existing project. Um, now, the Juju project is a fairly significant project that is actually um, owned and maintained by Canonical. I think I have that right. Um, and it has a huge number. It, it's a vast code base itself and it has a huge number of dependencies. And these sorts of problems of dependency management really start to bite you when you're doing things at scale. And so the Juju, the Juju code itself is also used as a benchmark for the compiler, I think I'm right in saying. Um, and it also represents a fairly good example of a large code base out there that has a lot of dependencies and could, therefore, if you've got a large number of dependencies, the chances of you running into some sort of dependency problem are probably pretty high. So let's just um, try and convert the Juju project itself, whatever uh, dependency management solution they're using today. Let's clone the code, as you can see here. And again, I'm working, just to be clear, I'm working outside of my Go path here. Okay, so just if you're using Go 111, I am working outside of my Go path, just, just to remind you here. So probably in slash temp here, for example. But it could be anywhere, just outside of your Go path. Then I'm just going to change into that directory, go mod in it. We saw that earlier on, saying I want to create a module here. And bear in mind, I ran this unless they've actually migrated the Juju code base to use um, Go modules. Since then, you could probably try this out yourself later on. So you can see it's creating the module, and it actually picks up a sensible-ish module name there by virtue of the fact that this is a Git repo and the remote is GitHub.com Juju Juju. Okay. And what it says as well here is copying requirements from gopackage.log. So actually, this is one of the massive capabilities that Go modules has, is that for that patchwork of, module, uh, of dependency management solutions that I sort of referenced earlier on out there, it understands a very large number of them and also how to migrate from them automatically. So you can see it's actually copied the requirements there, it's translated them into effectively module requirements. And then we're just going to run this go mod tidy here, and that's actually effective. You're just ensuring that our go.mod file is actually representative of what code we have on disk, i.e. the code that's in the Juju tree that we've checked out. That's it. I've literally converted the Juju project to use go modules, those two commands there. Now, I can't run all the tests here because guess what? There's a whole load of packages within the Juju module that have, I think, MongoDB requirements, etc. So they're not going to run. But that's literally all that's required in converting a, an existing project to use Go modules. So there's much more out there. Uh, there's much more to do with Go modules as well. The concept of publishing modules. Uh, the concept of proxy support for modules as well. So if you published a module, um, you don't have to go via version control systems. You can, can go via a proxy that understands this download protocol. As I said as well, this is one of the major um, features of 
a sort of a standard versioning system, dependency management system, is that we can then build version aware tools on top of this module support in the Go tool. So that's also part of the plan as well. And Go Hack here is one um, such project that sort of helps you actually work with replaced versions or forks of code. Um, there's full support for custom import paths if you have your own domain, and that's actually, you, you resolve effectively via a custom import path. That's fully supported, and as I mentioned as well, you can have modules within modules, and these become Go submodules. And so this effectively moves you away from the restriction, if I can call it that, where the unit of versioning before was the GitHub repo. You can now have modules within modules, and the module being the unit of versioning, and source code interchange means that you can just chuck all of that into a mono repo, as I've done with all of my code, and you can sort of pretend to be Google by having your own mono repo. <laughs> Yay. Um, the, the, there's already some really solid documentation on this. It, in places, it's a bit rough around the edges, but Go Help Modules, as I referenced earlier on, is a great starting point. Um, this, uh, this is Go Help Mod, and this sort of shows you the various subcommands that are available. Um, download, just to pick out one, of this, just start diving into this stuff, start using it, and start going via the actual Go command documentation as well. Why, why explain why I've got a package or a module um, as part of my dependencies. So how do I get started? I'm running out of time here, so apologies. Go 1.11 release candidate 1 was released two days ago. Um, so you should download and install it. Um, example code at the bottom there of how to actually use it if you don't want to download um, if you just want to use Go 111 in, in parallel to Go 1103 at the moment. As I said before and repeated, just work outside of your Go path if you want to do anything with modules or set a special environment variable, Go 111 module equals on, and you can work with modules inside Go path as well. But again, this is all covered in, guess what, Go help modules. Um, try out modules, uh, create your own modules, convert existing projects, you saw how easy that was. Ask questions, the link there is just a reminder on um, where to ask questions in the uh, Go community. The Slack channel has been pretty active. Um, Golang Nuts has been as well. Um, report issues for bugs that you might come across or things that you think might be a bug. Remember, it's sort of an ex experimental phase for Go 111, the Go module support, so please just help flush out all of these issues. And issues as well can be issues of documentation or lack thereof as well. Um, create experience reports as well. That's something I'm just going to try and push a bit as well. Um, as you're using modules, guess what? Everybody's use of modules might be slightly different. Their experience background might be slightly different. So experience reports really help to shape what modules are and how to interact with them, the UI, UX of it, if you like. So please just check out these links. I'll publish all these slides um, at the end of the talk. Some success stories. As I said, mentioned the Juju project, um, Roger was actually just sort of saying there's 175 um, module dependencies listed in the go.mod for the Juju project, which obviously doesn't count the modules that are then indirect dependencies that aren't listed because you're already depending on a module, as we saw earlier on. Uh, Filippo also, he's got his make cert um, package that he, project, excuse me, that he converted, I guess what, in three or four commands there, but that's also in order to add a bit of support for older versions of Go as well. Trivial. A um, couple of FAQ points, and this might sort of touch on questions we might get in a second, and apologies, I am running over. Um, should we replace DEP with modules? Kind of just sort of bear in mind that it's experimental for Go 111, but it's pretty solid. Um, I'd say that with some, some sort of experience of having used modules a bit already. Um, should we wait to start using modules? Absolutely not. Um, it, it's worth just trying it out, as I said, particularly if you're just keen to experiment with try out on a separate branch, fork, whatever. Just, just get, get your hands dirty with modules. Should we still be vendoring um, dependencies? Yes, if you want to support older versions of Go, because of course they don't understand modules. Some of them have, they, they Go 110.3 and 197 have limited sort of knowledge of these now semantic import version paths. So those two versions of Go know how to resolve that situation, but all the versions of Go don't. So there's some slightly tricky things that go on if you, you have a version that's greater than two, and that's kind of the last point there. If, if, you, if you're in that situation, sort of come and grab, grab me afterwards. Um, credits here, Russ Cox and Brian Mills. Russ Cox has basically done quite a lot of this single-handedly, which is massively impressive, but it must be said as well that Brian Mills has done a huge amount of work as well in just sort of um, really f fleshing out the detail of all of this, particularly in terms of the thinking through some of the more hard problems as well. 
But that obviously doesn't count all the people in the Go community, both inside and outside of Google, who've written the previous dependency managers, contributed to the discussions, etc. There's a huge amount of work gone into this today to get modules where they are today. Uh, Daniel, Roger, and Axel have given me a lot of thought and feedback on um, the, not only these slides, but just topics more broadly. So thanks to those. A couple of links at the end here. I, I've referenced them throughout, so there's no, no point particularly um, referencing them here. Um, I'll say thank you, and I'll stop. And I'm sorry, five minutes over.